much, uh, Anthony. Uh, I have the impression that this has been a very successful event over two days, uh, including the last very stimulating session. Uh, I didn't enter into this debate, but I've read somewhere that the majority of the members of the People's Congress in the Republic in, in, in China actually have a second passport. I don't know whether that's the case, but if that's the case, then it's a very clear sign of what do they think about uh, the long term and that they would like to have a foot in another system as well. Um, the ESPAS process has developed very, very nicely, I would say. Not very long ago, this has just been a pilot project, a pilot project which was proposed by the Budgets Committee of the European Parliament and it was very much uh, pushed forward by James Ellis, uh, was a member of that committee who is today uh, with us. I think that this conference marks the very successful transfer of this pilot project into now permanent mode. It's no longer a pilot project. We have continued the project in a new legislature and this ESPAS process is here to stay. Uh, I think we are also very lucky that with Ann Mettler uh, we have somebody in a very outstanding position in the European Commission who has taken over and has taken over the leadership, which is therefore also demonstrating the commitment of the European Commission uh, to this ongoing process. And last but not least, it's something which is still growing. Uh, we have been very pleased to welcome the Committee of the Regions into the process, the Economic and Social Committee, and I understand that also the European Central Bank is having some interest to participate. What it does is basically three things from my point of view. First, it helps us to develop a common culture of cooperation between the institutions that uh, might not sound so exciting, but I think it's a very serious and important shift from the past. We are all living in our own organizational entities and we like to develop ideas about the other. Uh, and those ideas about the other are the more exciting the less we know the other. Uh, so it's a bit troubling to get to know the other and find out that they might, have, they might be having reasonable arguments as well. Uh, but I can see that through this very close cooperation on the top level of the administration, a culture of cooperation is now coming into force among the leaderships of the administrations in the Commission, in the Council, in the Parliament, in the Committee of the Regions, in the Economic and Social Committee, and hopefully also going beyond. I would also like to draw attention to the Orbis website, uh, which is receiving documents on long-term trends from all over the world, and which has been successfully re-established in the past weeks and is also very quickly growing. So we are starting to establish a common reference point for everybody globally who is involved in this long-term trend community. So what are long-term trends about? From my point of view, long-term trend is not about long-term trends because long-term trends are not really so interesting. Uh, whether what we are describing is going to happen in 2030 or not, we cannot know. For me, it's a way to stress test our current systems. So we develop an idea on how the world might develop, how the European Union might develop, and this is giving us the possibility to ask are our own system sufficiently resilient and sufficiently prepared to cope with that future that's being identified? And I believe this becomes incredibly urgent that we further develop these kind of capacities. It is true that the European Union is always developing in crisis, but that doesn't mean that we should enjoy crises too much. And anyhow, if anybody has a special enjoyment for crises, I think this, uh, uh, this need is already sufficiently covered. Uh, we can also observe these days that these kind of crises are hitting us, like now immigration, and then the policy's response has to be developed in a rather painful process. It's of course not only immigration, we've seen similar things on 
the development of the euro um, and in general our economy. So I believe it is very important that we further develop this capacity not only to have a view of the future but rather to develop a common view of the future to identify where are the weaknesses in how we currently operate and therefore develop contingency plans for what might be waiting for us in the future. So I would like to thank you all very much for uh, this excellent conference. Also, um, Madame Richard has already been mentioned. I've mentioned Anne Mettler. Uh, I hope that you will come to the next conference as well. So thank you so much. So as the chair of uh, ESPAS, I, I want to uh, thank everyone who joined us uh, yesterday and uh, today uh, for this uh, uh, very successful conference. I agree with you, uh, Klaus, uh, as well as, of course, all the institutions involved. Klaus, you already mentioned them, so I won't repeat them. But I do want to say a special thanks to the European Parliament for hosting us so well today, especially to Anthony Teasdell and his uh, excellent team. We already mentioned it. Now, if I had to summarize uh, uh, three of my key takeaways uh, from these uh, last one and a half days, they would be as follows. So firstly, all sectors of the economy of society are changing really at a speed that we have never seen before. And this, of course, poses huge, formidable challenges to policymakers who are often uh, caught completely unprepared. Uh, Klaus already mentioned what happened with the refugee crisis. Now, this unprecedented speed of developments really only reinforced for me and uh, uh, probably also for the other partners in ESPAS, really the need for foresight, the need for anticipation. Uh, we, it's needed more than ever before. My second key takeaway is that this feeling that we are in constant crisis mode is probably and sadly something that is here to stay. Klaus already mentioned it. Future asymmetric shocks uh, are certainly on the horizon. They may come from economy. There was a lot of talk about China growing, but I could also conceive that maybe there is a, a prospect for the Chinese economy imploding. What will that mean? Um, they can come from business. Uh, there was a lot of talk yesterday about blockchain. Blockchain technology will lead to major disruptions in financial uh, services. Uh, what if it leaves tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people uh, without a job? They can come uh, from security challenges. What if we had a 9-11 style of attack uh, here in Europe uh, in coming years? So I don't mean to scare anyone here, but I do mean to say that the era of constant change, constant disruption, constant asymmetric shocks is here to stay. And this brings me to my third and final point. What is the role of policymaking in all this? Enrico Giovannini, who was one of the speakers uh, yesterday, uh, was also here today, said, we need to move from management by crisis to management by foresight. Another speaker yesterday, Alessa uh, Mosca, a member of the European Parliament said, the ultimate role as, a policy, as uh, politicians is not to predict the future, but to shape it. And in this spirit, my final takeaway is that foresight is about the courage to embrace and to shape the future. Don Tapscott commented on this yesterday. He was one of the keynote speakers yesterday when he said what was so remarkable about ESPAS, it's all the institutions coming together in an open and collaborative spirit. Now, this is someone who spends a lot of, even though he's Canadian, spends a lot of time in the United States and explaining how the institutions there, they fight each other, you know. Here we come together in the search for solutions through ESPAS, and I think it is something that is remarkable and we can be incredibly proud of. And with that, let's take ESPAS to the next stage. I think we're prepared. You've given us all a lot to think about. And all that remains for me to do is to thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's been an amazing experience these last one and a half days. And I think we can change the world. Thank you.
Well, we still have five minutes. So four comments, very briefly. First of all, I would like to apologize Jim Close, who is my boss, and who is now in a plane flying back from Valletta. So I'm very grateful to him because he gave me the opportunity to attend this very interesting conference today. So a few words from uh, the point of view of the Council Secretariat. First of all, of course, more than ever, we need time to think. We need time to reflect. We need time to think and to sit together. And this morning, this conference was in that sense remarkable. Not just the conference, but the whole ESPAS process. So I have to say that we fully support and we are very looking forward to our future work. Secondly, the fact that it, this initiative brings the institutions together is also remarkable because we have the same preoccupation and no single institution has a monopoly of wisdom. So I'm very happy that we are together here to, to sit and to think together. Third point is the fact that now that we have this report presented in February, we have the result of this conference, it's important to transform it and to uh, go through more operational action. What does it mean? Of course, we are just officials. We are not politicians. But we have to make sure that this report, this analysis, are brought to the political actors. Not just remarkable analysis, but also action. Time to think and time to act. I wanted to share with you a uh, reflection, some words I heard yesterday in the Parliament, or on Wednesday in the Parliament, during the debate on migration. A very interesting sentence I wanted to share with you. In our lives, we are responsible not only for what we do, but also for what we do not do. So let's try to act together and transform this very interesting conference into documents tool for our political actors. Thank you very much.